Let's forget it. I, I thank you for this award, even though in general I think former presidents and presidents should never get awards. I was delighted when Jimmy Carter won the Nobel Peace Prize because I thought he earned it, and I thought it was great because he got it as much for what he did after office as when he was in office. So, but in general, I think that the fact that we got to be president is quite honor enough. But because I admired and came to love Senator Fulbright, because he helped me when I was young and in need of it, I am, and because I believe the wisdom that you will find throughout his books and speeches applies with particular relevance to the present day, I am honored to receive this. I just ask you not to forget that for all of his intellectualism, he really understood that their politics had a limited purpose. It was supposed to stop abuses of power and create opportunities and conditions so that people could have their own lives and live their own dreams. I do not wish to embarrass one person in this audience, but uh, the new ambassador to the United States from Colombia, Andres Pastrana, was the president of Colombia when I was in office. He lost a member of his family in the violence there, and he still went alone, alone into the rainforest in an attempt, a last vain attempt, to make peace with uh, the guerrilla groups who have basically become terrorist henchmen for the narco traffickers. And when they repulsed him, I agreed that with the Speaker of the House, Mr. Hastert, to support something called Plan Columbia, to increase the military and judicial capacity of the Colombians to fight the narco-traffickers and to offer alternative ways of making a living. And we went to work there. America did this on a bipartisan basis, and I'm proud to say that President Bush has continued that policy. And, uh, President Pastrana's uh, successor did as well, Mr. Uribe. So when I went with my group to Colombia in 2000 to see Andres in his, before he left office, before I did, and to see what we were doing at Plan Colombia, I met a bunch of kids from a little village called Vianato who were singing and dancing for peace on the streets and Cartagena, and they got, and Chelsea went with me, and they pulled us out, and we danced with them in the street. I have a great picture of the president of Columbia and me and my daughter dancing with these kids in their native costumes. I was so impressed, I invited them to come to the White House in 2000 to sing at Christmas time. I'd never done that ever for a non-American group. And uh, they also sang, by the way, at the opening of my library. But in the middle of that, on June the 27th, 2002, at the invitation of President Pastrana and his successor, I went to Colombia to speak, to ask the business community not to leave, not to think America had given up on them so soon after 9-11. 35% of the country was in the hands of the narco-traffickers and their guerrilla supporters. You think how we'd feel in America if we had 35% of any stake. And I was met by the culture minister the power of ideas. These kids were a walking example of what Fulbright thought foreign policy ought to be about. And the culture minister, who was so famous, Andres's culture minister, she was known only to the Colombians by her first name, Consuelo. She had them there, and, and the first time we went, she brought them to the White House. But when I went back, she wasn't there anymore because the narco-traffickers and their thugs hated these kids, and they couldn't kill them, so they murdered Consuelo. And when Andres asked me to come back, they said, uh, first I spoke to her funeral over television, and as I remember, you had 100,000 people in the soccer stadium in Bogota. The Colombians are very brave people. <laughs> they had uh, their fist in the air. So I said, I'll come down there and speak for you, but I want you to bring those kids. So they brought the kids, June the 27th, 2002, with the new culture minister, the 29-year-old niece of the murdered woman. Her husband was a successful lawyer. He quit and became a government prosecutor. They're very brave people. But they prefer peace. Today, 13,000 guerrillas have laid down their arms. Opium production, poppies down 70%, coca production down 25%. 
the, go the country is one, and the former president is now our ambassador. And those little kids sang at my library dedication. Because they want peace. It's important to remember that. All authority and force, in the end, can only work if it is somehow brought into a line with people's dreams. And when you run the risk of killing somebody, it's okay if you have to do it to save more lives, to stop abuses. But we should remember, Fulbright was always humble about power. He always understood it had a very limited purpose to create the conditions and give people the tools and stop the abuses so that there would be a space for people to live their dreams. It's what education was about, it's what the Fulbright Exchange Program was about, it's what all this other stuff, was, all the international institutions were about. So I accept this prize with that in mind. And I ask you to, all of you who revere the memory of Senator Fulbright, to remember that he was a flesh and blood politician, an ultimate realist, and a fascinating man who wrote some darn good books. And you can go back and read them today and find out that what he recommended in the context of the Cold War, in my judgment, is more, not less, relevant today. So if you don't remember anything else I say today, remember that. I accept this award because what he recommended is more, not less, relevant today. It's got a fancy new name called soft power. But it basically reflects Sam Rayburn's famous admonition that we should never tell anyone to go to hell unless we can make them go. <laughs> and in this life, there are relatively few people we can make go to hell. So we should make as many common causes as we can. You've done me great honor today. I hope we can do the memory of Senator Fulbright honor by making America not only the strongest country in the world, but the world's best partner in the fight for our common dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for that wonderful insight into the thought process of the late Senator Fulbright. And I won't forget the, your admonition to us to let our kids dream their dreams. The Fulbright Association and Fulbright alumni around the world are very proud that you're here with us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Coca-Cola Company, Neville Isdell, an old friend who helped us honor the inaugural Fulbright Prize laureate, Nelson Mandela, in 1993. Fulbright alumni are very appreciative of the Coca-Cola Foundation's support of the Fulbright Association and, in particular, of the Fulbright Prize. Please join me in welcoming Neville Isdell to present the statue tribute to President Clinton. <coughs> Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Fenton, Mr. President, Ms. Fulbright, distinguished guests. On behalf of the Coca-Cola Company, it really is my pleasure to join you all today to honor William Jefferson Clinton, the youngest two-term president of the United States. And you heard it today, the world's youngest elder statesman.
And to follow his encyclopedic memory, but also his very strong connection with the ideas of Senator Fulbright, in praising him for what he did as president and what we're honoring him for today as an ex-president is actually very difficult. But he, had, he also has been very far-sighted. He understood all the challenges that technology and globalization were and how that was going to transform our planet and how that affects the relations not just between nations but within communities and how we are much more interdependent today than ever before. The strengthening of this nation, what he called One America, is exemplified in everything that he has done. But particularly, I want to talk about the global force that he was as president and is today in terms of continuing to bring the world together. And I want to just personally, as an Irishman, go to the work that he did in Ireland. And he went above and beyond the call of duty to bring that little piece of the world called Northern Ireland, where I was born, together. The terrible sectarian divide which needed to be bridged. And he helped together with Senator Mitchell, and goodwill from people on both sides to create a climate which allowed the Good Friday Agreement to take place and which has certainly stopped the violence. Again, it was dialogue. So it's an appropriate legacy that Senator Fulbright left behind and that President Clinton picked up. And I, as an Irishman, and the Irish people are very grateful for what you did in that one particular incident. As Fenton May has told you that we've honored before 12 remarkable people with the Fulbright Prize. To have started off with Nelson Mandela, whose long walk to freedom resonated around the world and has continued to inspire, I think, each and every one of us, what he was able to do personally to President Havel, the first president of the Czech Republic, and President Vernitsky, Franz Vernitsky of Austria, who played a crucial role when the war came down in terms of, again, bringing the world together. I am really privileged for this to be the fourth award because I think it ties back to some of the ideas of Nelson Mandela in terms of the individual who is receiving this award. It is part of what we at the Coca-Cola Company like to believe, and that that is that we are a force for good in the world, that we join communities, that we are part of a positive globalizing society. And that is why, with UN Secretary General Kofi Annan last month, I signed on behalf of the Coca-Cola Company the UN Global Compact, confirming our total commitment to the 10 points of the Global Compact, in particular workers' rights, human rights, protection of the environment, and anti-corruption. Two months ago, I was privileged to attend the funeral of Coretta Scott King. It was a very memorable day. Some wonderful eulogies were made by her children, by colleagues, by former presidents. But President Clinton, when he stood up in this very serious moment, addressed the casket and said to everyone, I want us not to forget there's a woman inside here. <laughs> not a symbol, a real woman who lived and breathed and got angry and got hurt and had dreams and disappointments. And then he said, Atlanta, maybe he said Atlanta, but anyway, 